When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Canva presents a true crime of design. In the office, Maya spots something unusual in the presentation. What's this? It was an off-brand font. Her co-worker explains. I added the font. I thought it was fun. It was not. Maya solved it with Canva. Open up Canva, one click, and the font is on brand. Easy. Stay on brand and solve font crimes at canva.com. The home for every brand. John Bonet Ramsey. She was strangled with a cord. Little Miss Colorado. Six-year-old murder victim, John Benet Ramsey. Unknown intruder. Her brother. John Benet Ramsey. Oh my God! They still have not interviewed the parents. John Ramsey didn't do it, and he didn't have a clue of anybody to do it. My life has been hell from that day forward, and I want nothing more than to find out who was responsible for this. In 2006, a former school teacher, John Mark Carr, confessed out of the blue to the 1996 strangulation of John Bonet in graphic sexual detail. On August 17, 2006, Thailand authorities arrested John Mark Carr, a 42 year old American teacher. He had been living in Thailand on the lam after facing child pornography charges in the U.S. Carr had been emailing a Colorado professor and was making incriminating statements about his involvement in John Bonet's death. The Boulder District Attorney's Office wanted to charge him with murder. He was extradited back to the United States and brought to Boulder, Colorado to be arraigned for her murder. This from August 20, 2006 from CNN.com, a video titled In Carr's Own Words. A reporter asked, I am with the Associated Press. Can you give us a brief statement? Carr replies, I, I love John Bonet and she died accidentally. Reporter asks, Are you an innocent man? Carr says, No. What happened? Carr replies, Um, her death was an accident. So you were in the basement? Carr says, Yes. The reporter asks, Can you tell us about your connection to the Ramsey family? Carr says, No, he cannot comment on that. How did you, or how did you get into the basement? Again, Carr says no comment on that. Reporter, and how, how do you feel now? How have you been treated? Carr says, I've been treated okay. Asked, how long had you known John Bonet? And again, he says, I have no comment on that. Here are some other statements made by Carr. Carr says, I was with John Bonet when she died. Now this is not technically a confession, but more of an admission. He did not say, I killed John Bonet, just I was with John Bonet when she died. Another one of Carr's interesting statements, and this, of course, is in regards to John Bonet. He says, it's very important for me that everyone knows that I love her very much, that her death was unintentional, that it was an accident. Then the September 4, 2006 issue of People Magazine claims they have an exclusive jailhouse interview with John Mark Carr. Turns out this was not the case. In fact, People Magazine interviewed the Thailand authorities who told them what Carr said. They say that Carr said 
The Ramseys feel their daughter was brutally murdered, and she wasn't. It looks like that, but she wasn't. I want them to hear the truth. I need closure, and her family needs closure. All of us have gone through enough pain. Then the Boulder District Attorney announced that they were dropping the charges against John Mark Carr in the John Benet Ramsey murder. They say it turns out DNA on the body at the scene did not match that of Carr's DNA. Secondly, a great defense is always a good alibi. It has been reported that the police never interviewed Carr's family prior to his arrest and extradition to the United States. Most people know where they were during the Christmas season. Carr's family has always said and always maintained their statements that Carr was with them when John Bonet was killed. But Carr says the DNA might not match, but you can't trust the test. Yeah, and it's possible, and we can get into the DNA later, not matching, but it seems like he's just seeking out attention and that he's a lying shit princess. Well, he's got a face for camera. <laughs> he has a face for radio. Yeah. He, no, I, I'm joking. I mean, he's he's not... Uh, mm. He's... It's fugly. Right. Mm. He's less pleasant to look at than he is to listen to. On July 9th, I want to get into this real quick here because it's going to translate into further discussion that we'll get into. On July 9th, 2008, Mary Lacey, the Boulder District Attorney announced that recently developed touch DNA technology had cleared all members of John Benet Ramsey's family of her slang. DNA from an unknown male was found on two articles of clothing on John Benet's person. Many have argued, and I believe very rightfully so, why this DNA evidence clears the family, if it in fact should even clear the family at all, being John, Patsy, and Burke. Right. This DNA evidence only proves two things, that an unknown male was possibly present at the crime scene. We do not know where the DNA came from and that the DNA does not belong to the Ramsey family. As statementanalysis.com put it, this evidence does not exonerate the Ramseys. It does not prove they were not present or were not involved or do not know who killed John Benet. Regardless of all of that, the DNA found on John Bonet did not match Carr's DNA, and the murder charges were in fact dropped. He was sent to California to face child pornography charges. I want to stay on this DNA for just a little bit longer because one of the reasons why they believe that this DNA shouldn't be tested against anybody that comes forward or any suspect is that they don't know if it's a mixture of DNA. It, they go, well, it's a single male. That's what they believe it is. But even in the test results, it says it could be two to three males, like a combination. Not meaning that there's even two or three people involved in her murder, just that this DNA is a combination. of it could be a combination of multiple people. Therefore, you'll never get a match when you're comparing multiple people's DNA to one person. Right. And I mean, it's interesting that, that we have the DNA and it was found on two articles of clothing on her that were on her person as she lay there in that wine cellar, which is of interest. I don't think it should be ignored. I think, and I'm going off of expert opinion as well and just really agreeing with them where several experts have stated that they don't find this type of DNA evidence to be of any value when it comes to eliminating a suspect or or trying to convict a suspect. Right. That it's simply for now, until we can prove otherwise, it's simply for now DNA that we, we can't identify, that is believed to come from a man, doesn't seem to match any of the Ramseys, but we don't know how it got there or how long it was there. Yeah, and it's hard for me to believe that with such a vicious attack, there would be no DNA left at the scene at all. But again, I think everybody involved in this case or anybody that has researched this case can start off with the idea that the crime scene is heavily contaminated. And I actually don't want to fault 
I don't want to fault law enforcement too much for that because I, I do believe they went into this situation going, it's a kidnapping. And yes, what they should have done is stop everything and go, let's make sure that this is actually a kidnapping and there's no child in this house. But they missed that step. And that caused a, a blunder of other things to go wrong. Because of the date it happened on, I think it's reasonable to see why they missed that step. I look. I somewhat agree with you, I but I disagree in a sense that I don't think that anybody in the public should feel any less safe on December 26th than they would any other time of year, any other date that, I agree. that's on the calendar. Yeah. And, and you're right in, in a way that because it's been by Boulder, Colorado's own detectives and police that state this couldn't have happened on a worse day. This is the day that it's toughest for us to get a full staff to get the most people working. It's just a it's a bad day scheduling wise. No, right. But turns I, out it's a great day to commit a murder. Right. But what I mean by that is that maybe that these officers would miss a step one because it's right after a holiday, but two because they just spent time with their friends and family, and so when you hear, oh, we have a kidnapping. Like I said, it could just be as simple as, well, we're going to believe the parents right away when maybe they want it if it was three weeks later. Yeah, I also think that my wishes truly are that Boulder Police Department, that they would have treated it as a kidnapping as soon as they were notified of a kidnapping. And that does not appear to have taken place to me. Right. Let's talk about Linda Hoffman Pugh. She worked for the Ramsey. She was their housekeeper. This is one thing that separates her from many of the other people that we've already discussed. She had a key to the home. She had a key to the Ramsey's house. Her husband, Mervyn, worked with Linda and for the Ramsey's on a few occasions. On the evening of 12 27, 1996, this is the day after all of the, the mess that we just kind of touched upon right. at the, the Ramsey home in the investigation, police showed up at the Pew's home and they wanted her to write the number $118,000 on a piece of paper and reportedly took her fingerprints and several strands of her hair at that time as well. Linda confirmed the police's suspicions of John Bonet possibly having a bed wedding problem. There are several publications that say Linda accuses Patsy Ramsey of killing John Bonet and it appears that she did. I believe this may just have been in retaliation, especially after learning that the Ramseys put Linda and her husband on a list of people they would consider to be suspects. And then some extended family pointed to them as well. The extended Ramsey family member told police Linda had asked Patsy for a loan. Many publications out there stated that the Ramseys refused to help her out. And Linda's family was struggling and desperately needed the money. This sounds very ominous and certainly presents a cloud of suspicion, but let's clear a bunch of things up here. Linda did, in fact, ask Patsy for a loan. The loan amount was for $2,000. And Patsy and John, they agreed to help her out. They gave her the money. And the agreement was that they would take $200 out of each of her paychecks until the loan was paid back. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, it wasn't like Linda was super desperate for money. Yes, her and her husband struggled at times, but she had a good job working for the Ramseys, and Mervyn was even able to pick up some work because of her job as well. The loan was for car repairs and dental work, these both being emergency situations that can be expensive that spring up without notice, we have all experienced this. Right. Let's keep in mind, too, even more so than the Ramseys, the police were considering everyone with a key to the home to be a suspect at that time in the investigation. Do you see some of the reports that speculate that there was as many as 20 keys not, not accounted for? I've seen multiple numbers reported over the years. One thing that is pointed out by the detectives that were working the case was the when they first started off investigating the murder, as soon as they knew it was a murder, 
they wanted to know who had keys and how many were out there. And that number that was provided to them by the Ramseys was much, much different than what their investigation would lead them to, to find. Now, Linda was someone who had a key to the home, as we stated. And regardless of what some of these publications say that are out there, Linda, when first questioned by police, never suggested that Patsy or John were guilty of anything other than loving their children. She even stated that she worried about the beautiful little girl, meaning John Bonet, who was allowed to ride her bike unsupervised and said someone must have seen her and attempted to take the little girl. This statement obviously pointing toward an unknown intruder rather than the Ramseys. Mervyn, however, told police that the few times he was in the home, he found the home to be very difficult to navigate, saying if you just turned around, you'd get lost. This statement pointing toward an insider. If it was an intruder, of course, Hoffman Pugh does not even fit the profile the police were working with, which was white male, former convict, 25 to 30 years old. Hoffman Pugh was 57 at the time, and her husband was about the same age. Years later, she did testify in front of a grand jury for a total of eight hours, including a statement against Patsy that read, quote, I think she had multiple personalities. She'd be in a good mood and then she'd be cranky. She got into arguments with John Bonet. The Linda Hoffman Pugh theory, as it goes, says the housekeeper led a trusting John Bonet down into the basement that night in an attempt to trick her employers into leaving money for her ransom. It is possible that she could have seen John Ramsey's pay stub for $118,000 as a bonus. Familiar with both the home and the family's schedule, Hoffman Pugh makes a convenient suspect and without a solid alibi. She says she was asleep in bed while her husband allegedly slept on the couch. She has, however, never been formally accused of this crime, and there's really no evidence pointing to her, just speculation by mainly a lot of it coming from Patsy's mother. Now, we've spent the last episode and portion of this episode discussing some of the people we believe should be in the conversation of suspects. There, there are nobody in there that we are specifically saying should be a suspect. Just when you want to look at people that you might want to look into with the investigation, these would all be people that the captain and I would take a look at. There are a few people that we haven't discussed yet, and that would be some true insiders in this case the three Ramsey family members that were inside the home. Obviously, we cannot discuss every person that's ever been thought to be a suspect by whomever out there. Yeah, I mean, we we thought about after the second episode just going, screw it, let's do 100 episodes on this case. But then we decided against that. Well, just the suspects alone would be extremely exhausting, one to report and two to listen to as well, because... The Ramseys, John and Patsy, supply Boulder police with a list of suspects. The list that they gave to police, now it grew as the investigation went on. Right. But the latest report that I heard was that that number was at 168, that the Ramseys gave the police department 168 people to look at, and obviously their names were not included on this list. So... Right, but if your child was murdered and you weren't involved, at some point you would start just naming everybody you knew just to have them look at anybody because they're not, at this point, you don't know who they've looked at, what leads they have, uh, or where they're going, how close they are. So at some point you're, you start becoming desperate. I get that. And that's that, just like everything else in this case, is where you can take one bit of information and you could use it to argue for or against the Ramseys. Yeah. So where every one of us would expect innocent people to supply a very lengthy list in a desperation to find justice for their daughter. The flip side of that is the suspicion of going, well, they have something to hide. So they're providing police with this very extensive list giving them all these errands and chores to do 
to really steer the direction of the investigation away from themselves. To further compound that a bit, we do have statements by Patsy Ramsey, who says at some point in the investigation, she was suspicious of uh, saying that she believed the killer could have been a Colorado University student. Well, that adds several thousands more people to the list of suspects. So it's really one of those tricky things. The other thing that I found interesting about this, and this is actually a real, I think this is a very possibly legit answer. Mm -hmm. We do know that the Ramseys did provide a suspect list. That's not in question. That absolutely happened. What I believe is in question is the number of people that the Ramseys put on that list. Right. Because that number has been reported all over the shop. It's a pretty high number. I'll say that. But I found this statement to be, it's really a response that John Ramsey had. It either shows his level of intelligence or his level of innocence or possibly his level of he thinks he might be set up being wrongfully accused of something. And it was this, one of his friends contacted him. Their conversation was Ramsey wanted to know, well, why did you say you said some things about me that I didn't really like. Right. And his, his friend or acquaintance, I don't know the the strength of their relationship and the, the statements themselves, they, they weren't even really a big deal in my opinion, but the friend says to John, well, I only said that stuff because, uh, or I only said that you should be a suspect because police came to me and told me that you told them that I should be a suspect. Right. And John Ramsey's response to that was, look, I didn't say you should be a suspect. They're just telling you and telling everybody else out there in our, our circle of friends and coworkers that we have said everybody else is a suspect they're, they're trying to stir the pot is what right. John Ramsey's basically saying. They're trying to stir the pot so that you will give them stuff about us. You will give them dirt on us. So it's really one of those really difficult things to kind of sift through who is right, who is wrong and what this particular thing could mean. I, in the beginning of, of this investigation thought that that number of 168 people named as suspects by the Ramsey was a crazy number and it pointed to something that they might be trying to hide. Right. As I go through it, I question that, that action number, yeah, less yeah. and less and less. One thing we do need to talk about too, which added suspicion in the public's eye to the Ramseys. And I believe it added suspicion in the eyes of law enforcement as well. Working the case is what has always been referred to as the Ramsey's hiding behind a wall of lawyers. And some people have even gone as far to call this wall of lawyers, team Ramsey. The one of the attorneys hired by the Ramsey's was, this is from an old case and it's from representation to a person named Lee Lindsay. Her husband was shot to death inside their home. Now Lee Lindsay was found innocent John hired that same defense attorney to represent him. It's an interesting strategy. Again, it's just another one of those things that you could argue either side. This points to him having something to hide. This points to him just wanting good representation so he doesn't get wrongfully accused. John and Patsy had different attorneys and Burke had his own attorney as well. Now, we should point out they're all paid for by John Ramsey, but they're all receiving separate representation. Some people point to that as being very strange as something very weird. I really, to me, Captain, my opinion on that, I could go either way on it. I, I would, I would really want somebody with a strong opinion on it to, to offer up their opinion to me as to why I should feel one way or the other about it. I don't really think that it points to anything. I think, again, initially it pointed to me that, well, if let's pretend I'm the husband and, and there's what a, does that make me Patsy when you're not involved in this? Oh, okay. If I'm the husband in a situation where my, my child has been killed and the police are now looking at me and my wife as potential suspects, which you know, they're going to, what if I'm in a situation where, 
I know I'm innocent, but I don't fully know if my spouse is innocent. Right. Well, then it would make very much sense if I hired an attorney for me. And if I had, if I were a man of money, then I would probably hire one for her as well. But we would be represented by two different people because my interest and her interest in this investigation are not the same. And therefore we need different representation. Yeah. It'd be awesome if you're a man of money because we could turn on the heat in the garage. Now the flip side of that is what if I know that I'm innocent and I know my wife to be innocent as well. Mm -hmm. I know that a very common police tactic and detective tactic would be for them to separate us and question us at the same time in separate areas and separate locations, thus making it impossible for the attorney representing both of us to physically represent both of us during that situation. Right. You see how this pendulum swings back and forth. It's, it's aggravating. It's interesting. It's truly a fascinating case, but with a lot, with a lot of unanswered questions. Right. But I view it from the standpoint of what John Ramsey says. The day of the crime, he talks to police officers the day of the crime, they have Burke talk to an investigator without anybody present. They also send Burke to their friend's house where he could have said God knows what if, if he was responsible for this or if he knew what happened. What John Ramsey says is that they're willing to cooperate. They had some suspicion from their friend saying you probably should get a lawyer to help you through all this. But when the police would not give back her body so they could have the burial. That's when John said that was the line drawn in the sand and you don't want to give our dead child back so we can bury her until you have a sit down, sit down conversation with both him and Patsy. And I think at that point he realized, um, this was kind of war. And I think he was, I don't even think it was whether it was right or wrong. I think it was just like, I think he felt that it was very disrespectful. And from then on, I'm not going to play by your rules. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Canva presents true crime of design. In the office, Maya spots something unusual in the presentation. What's this? It was an off-brand font. Her co-worker explains. I added the font. I thought it was fun. It was not Maya solved it with Canva. Open up Canva, one click, and the font is on brand. Easy. Stay on brand and solve font crimes at canva.com. The home for every brand. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Captain. This week we are sipping on a little Christmas ale by the good people at Great Lakes Brewing Company, garage grade. 
That would be five bottle caps. Mm -hmm. Pick up some Christmas ale for yourself, for your family, for this year's festivities. All right, Captain, we're kind of the point now where we're really only left with about three people left to discuss. And these would be the complete total insiders in this whole entire case. The three Ramsey family members that were inside the home the night that John Bonet was killed. We mentioned yesterday the experts or several people that stated that they believe in an intruder theory is the best theory for this case. Regarding the insider theory, we have CBS, Robert Ressler, Greg McQuarrie, Dr. Cyril Wecht, and Steve Thomas. Two retired FBI agents. That is the flip side of the coin of John Douglas, I guess. And we have Cyril Wecht, who is an expert in forensics, as well as Steve Thomas, who would be the flip side of the coin for Lou Smith. Lou Smith was brought in to work this investigation for the prosecutors, for the team of prosecutors. Steve Thomas was a member of the Boulder Police Department and was a detective at the time, and he was one of the lead investigators on the Ramsey investigation. The strange thing being here is that these two investigators worked on the same team at the same time of the same investigation and had two completely different opinions on what happened, what took place, who was responsible for the murder. And both of them believed so strongly in their theory that the evidence that they could see backed up what they suspected so much so that both of them eventually resigned from working the case at all. And that's pretty strong commitment to your theory. Yeah, 100%. We have stated that some people were eliminated, whatever words you want to use in regards to very things that are very specific, like handwriting, possibly DNA. Alibis. Alibis. The only true people that in my, that I'm willing to go along with and agree with that have been officially cleared in this case were cleared very early on in the investigation. And there were only four of them. And that would be John Andrew and Melinda Ramsey, John's two older children, right? as well as Fleet and Priscilla White. Those four have been officially cleared. And I agree with all four of those statements. This being basically that it was proven to be physically impossible for any of these four people to be involved because they have an ironclad alibi. The two older children were not even in the state of Colorado. They would need to either own a private jet or a time machine to... Or teleport. Yeah, have possibly been able to commit this crime. And it appears the same way with Fleet and Priscilla White as well, based off of they had a bunch of guests at their home overnight and... There's just multiple people stating that until the wee hours of the morning, they're both accounted for. It's not like one of these statements like, oh, we went to bed at eight o'clock and I didn't get up and do anything till the next morning. No, they were up hanging out with these people until right. until the wee hours of the morning. They were pulling what I call a crispy kernel. So this leaves us with three of the more popular suspects in this case. And, you know, I remember when I was a child and this case was in the news that there were people screaming at the top of their lungs. The parents did it. The parents did it. And then years later, a popular theory came out that maybe the brother did it either way for somebody in the home to have killed John Bonet without question, there has to be a cover up. And then you have to go to the extent of how many people do you believe were to be involved in that cover up and why the the need for the cover up in the first place. John Ramsey was a popular suspect early on, and this would be based off of the salacious photos that came out of this young six year old blonde in these beauty pageants wearing clothing and outfits that people didn't think were appropriate. And you carry that out a little further. People wondered, well, could she have been sexually abused? Was there abuse going on in inside the home? And could John Ramsey be guilty of such abuse? The other thought here is we have Patsy Ramsey. 
the Patsy Ramsey theory to me is, is I think I was going to say interesting, but I don't think that's the right word. I think it's complicated is, is the better word. And I say that because in regards to Patsy having killed John Binet and then covered it up, it seems like there could be many motivating factors for Patsy. Right. Where with John, it, it seems pretty cut and dried that it's just either that he must have been abusing her sexually and it led to this and then it was covered up. And now, well, it seems like we have evidence that points against the idea that she was abused long term. And the the where the place where this theory then splits is you could go, OK, well, did. Patsy help him cover up, cover it up, or was she aware of other things going on or not? Right. With the Patsy theory, it's it's a number of things. It could be that John Bonet wet the bed, and there was an attack, an impulsive attack that took place, and then it was covered up later, or she was in some weird way jealous that her daughter is being molested by her husband and flew into some kind of rage. Yeah, or it's possible that she was molesting her daughter herself. She was molesting the daughter. One interesting theory, too, is that John's molesting the daughter in in some type of what was meant to be a heroic act to come in and, and attack this man, attack her husband who's violating her daughter, that in some freak accident, she accidentally struck John Bonet in the head instead. And then they work together to cover it up. The theories are as bizarre as you can imagine. And then there's others that, that make some sense. Now, mind you, you need the evidence to back them up. Yes. And this is where it might even get more complex, but I believe based on the autopsy that it shows that John Bonet was not being molested for years. So to me, that rules out Patsy molesting John Bonet or John molesting John Bonet. I also would find it very strange uh, to have a situation where we have molestation of a child, of your own child, in a house that there is no pornography at all found or any claims at all by any friends. They had a lot of close friends no claims whatsoever uh, about child abuse. So to me, I think you can take that off the table. I certainly don't lean that way, that that was the situation, that that was what was going on long term. And I back that up by saying, look, this John was not a first time father. Okay, he had other children that have nothing but good things to say about him. Usually with an offender that would would reoffend on the same victim over and over again, it's not uncommon that they just victimize one child. Right. But it's more common that they victimize more than one of the children. So I don't lean that way and it also appears that out of the this was a, a young girl that was very well cared for in the sense that she had 27 doctor's visits in the course of three years. Now, some people call that into suspicion. I'm fine with that. It's suspicious to me, too. But what's not suspicious is a lot of times when there is some form of physical abuse or sexual abuse, you're not running to the doctor for every little thing that comes up because sometimes a doctor can detect these things or can question Mark's on a child. There's things with, with John Binet and, and her body and, and the examines, the, the examinations of her body and these doctor visits. I don't think that we can 100% rule out the possibility of some type of sexual abuse. It just doesn't seem like anybody, people that have firsthand knowledge of all these situations and of John Binet it doesn't seem that anybody leans that direction. Right. These are these are things that could be explained away by sexual abuse, but also could be explained away a million other ways and have been. Irritations due to wetting the bed, wetting yourself, irritations to bubble bath. Right. You know, any number of different things going on here. So, 
Yeah, I'm with you, Captain. I don't see a situation where we have long-term sexual abuse. Now, that doesn't mean that sexual abuse cannot be the motivating factor for what happened here. It very well could be that this was the very first time that this ever took place and it went, it ended in murder. Right. I think if you believe that, then you have to believe the evidence of the autopsy and that means that there would have been something that happened on the 23rd. So again, like you said, it's new developing um, sexual molestation, but by a parent, I just, I just don't see it there. I just think there's such a lack of evidence of that. And I think it makes maybe a little more sense with the idea of that this bedwetting becomes a issue and the person that's dealing with it constantly is Patsy. And so something happened there. But again, it it's strange to me. It's just, it's this is so complicated because you have to start picking what happened first. And I don't believe a hit or the fracture of the skull happened first. So if that did happen first and somebody could prove to me that happened first, then I'd go, well, yeah, Patsy got a little upset and, and pushed her and she hit her head or she accidentally hit, hit John Bidet on top of the head with something and then used this grot to cover it up. But I just don't see that to be the case. In regards, can you, can you clear up what you mean by something occurring on the 23rd? Well, because the, because the examiner claims that the, the day that she was murdered, there's evidence that there's digital molestation, right? And that, but there's also evidence that it would have happened. And when we use the word chronic, he was stating that it probably happened on the 22nd or the 23rd. So there was evidence of some kind of molestation on the day she was murdered and then on the 22nd and the 23rd. So meaning if it was somebody on the inside, it could have been the second time that such an act took place. Yeah, I'm just, I'm taking that off the table because to me it doesn't, there's no evidence that points and I just, there's no evidence that points that John Ram- Ramsey was doing that. There's no evidence that points that Patsy Ramsey was doing that. No, I agree with you too. I'm not willing to take it off the table because it sounds like the medical examiner says that something took place. Right. And look, she's in the company of her family more than anybody else. She's a six year old child. Mm -hmm. So I won't take it off the table when there's still, there's still reason to leave it on the table. I think the, the difficulty with this case, as you were the road, you were starting to go down there is one it's it's a it's a general misconception in this case that the belief that she was struck on the head and then strangled with this garrot and the whole strangulation of the garrot was an act to cover up an accidental hit to the head a strike to the head which of course duh anybody could make a case for that to have been Patsy Burke John what have you The problem being is it seems that all the experts seem to agree that the strangulation came first and the strike on the head occurred either at the same time or shortly after. So what that says to me is that the use of this garrot, of this strangulation, of whatever was happening before John Bonet was struck on the head, you... It can't be a cover up in the sense that the garrote was not used as a cover up. The strangulation was not used as a cover up. This occurred before the strike on the head. Right. And, then, and there's multiple things to point us to this. One, she has defensive wounds, meaning that John Bonet, when she was being strangled with this garrote, she tried to pull it off her neck. And there's indents all over her neck, fingernail indents to show that she was conscious when she was being choked 
and she tried to stop it. If she was hit on the head, that blow to the head that caused that massive fracture would have left her probably brain dead. She would have had severe brain swelling. She would have had severe brain bleed. So she wouldn't be able to be conscious to stop this attack. Now, is it possible that she was strangled for a while, hit on the head, and then strangled again? That's very possible. But this idea that she was hit on the head first is just, it makes zero sense. And I always believed the CBS reports. When I watched the first CBS documentary, I went, well, there you go. That that seems like it makes a lot of sense. And you have these paid investigators and these forensic experts sitting on this board going, yeah, this is probably what happened or something to that this effect. You have to believe, again, the idea that John Bonet comes up and takes some pineapple away from her brother, and then he turns around and hits her on the head with some kind of object, maybe the flashlight. That's what they said in the CBS report. I think you said you don't think a nine-year-old would be strong enough to do that blow. I lean towards your expertise on that. But it's also, you can't see the fracture. You can see the fracture after the autopsy. That's because, to put it bluntly, they removed the skin. Right. You can't see. There was see. no laceration. There was no open head wound. To, right. She's to not bleeding anything. all over the place. The, the medical examiner, the pathologist, Dr. Myers, he was unaware of the blow to the head until, until well into the examination of the body. Right. He, going off of sight scene of what he sees at the at the uh, crime scene and what he sees on the body of the victim, he's immediately going, oh, this was strangulation. Pretty obvious. The rope's still around her neck. Sorry. Right. But it wasn't until further examination did he discover this strike to the head. And I'm, look, there have been experts out there. Again, I'm no expert, but- you're an expert in the garage. There have been experts out there that said, yes, a nine-year-old could do, could carry out this type of right. violent strike to uh, the head of a small child and cause this amount of damage. I'm sorry, man. I've seen the, the, the pictures and unfortunately had to stare at them long enough. I refuse to believe that. I, I simply, it, it, it Look at the right, pictures, right. But man. Let's I'm, go down this road for a second. Because right. let's just say he was able to do that blow. And let's just say that you can say Patsy saw him hit her or didn't see Burke hit her. At some point, she comes upon her lifeless body. But guess what? She's still breathing. She is still breathing. So maybe some time passes, but you're going to tell me this mother that loves her daughter isn't just going to call the ambulance? Because guess what? We have evidence of what happens when Burke hits his sister in the, in the face with a golf club. He gets in trouble. They take her to the emergency room. Do you think she comes a upon her lifeless child's body but guess what the child is breathing so you you want to tell me that she's not going to just call 911 and say hey we we need help we need an ambulance because she would have no clue she is not a medical examiner she's not a doctor she's not a nurse she has no clue you're I would assume that most people, most adults that came across a six-year-old that was unconscious and there was no evidence of her where she was hit, that they wouldn't call 911 to try to save their daughter's life. So people want you to think that she just automatically assumed that she was dead, decided to make a garage, 
and start choking her violently. Not like haphazardly, violently. And choke her so much that the rope moves places. But then somehow during all this, John Bonet comes to and then defends the choking. And once her child comes to, she goes, oh, well, it's too late for you. We're just covering this up for Burke. We got to save Burke. And then she continues to choke. And then we got to stage some molestation. But again, the evidence points that not only did it happen that day, but it probably happened a couple days before. So did you stage that too? And then we got to start staging all these other things. Now we got to write this ransom note. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And regardless if it makes sense or not, the science doesn't back any of that up. No. This, what the science backs up is that she was strangled and then struck in the head in that exact order. Right. And what what backs that up is the what the science shows is a slowing of the blood moving to the brain at that time. Right, that's one piece of evidence. Meaning that she was either in the act of dying when she was struck on the head, or very, you know, she's in the act of dying or very close to death. Right. Something is causing blood to be slowed or stop going to the brain, and then she's struck in the head. What stopped that was the strangulation that was going on with the garrote. Yeah. At the time that she was struck on the head. So you're not using the garrote to cover up being struck in the head. You're not using sexual abuse to cover up the strike to the head. What you have here is a situation where, unfortunately, we have sexual assault and a a, a very vicious sexual act of cutting off the air to the to to a six year old to a six year old. Yeah. And then during the commission of doing all that, there is a strike to the head. Whether the offender struck her on the head because he believed she was dead and wanted to make sure or wanted to strike her on the head to cover up and confuse what was going on at the scene, we can't say. We can't say that. But what we can say based off of the science is that the act of strangulation was taking place before the strike to the head occurred. So just to try to work somebody off of our list if you're going to believe that Burke possibly did this, then you have to reconcile the fact that she was being choked before being struck on the head. You have to take it a step further and say, well, he was, he built this fancy garage and he was choking right. her and then he smacked her over knots, the head. Yeah. And, and th- th- look, it makes for a good story, but I don't see the evidence to suggest that that's what in fact occurred. What I do see evidence of is a, the the problem with the people in the house is we have John who could be guilty. We have Patsy who could be guilty. And then we could have all three that were somehow in on it together. One thing that I believe you can absolutely cross off your list and take off the table is that Burke did all of this by himself. Right. Take that one off because he's nine years old. He didn't write that letter. He didn't write that ransom letter. He didn't construct that garrote. I don't know why a nine-year-old would be into this type of sexual assault that I believe to be taking place in that basement. Right, or how they would even know about that at all. And then you would have to convince me that he's strong enough to inflict that severe, severe blow to the head. And he also has to write the note by himself. Right, so there's... And, and, yeah. And he has to tie the sophisticated knots. I just don't see that being a possibility. And again, maybe a heavy enough object, maybe you can create the fracture. I'd be more interested to see if a nine-year-old could inflict the damage around the neck with the garage. Because you'd have to be pulling pretty pretty hard. So I, I just don't see it. Here's my thing, though, is I've been thinking about this a lot. Why did I watch the CBS report? And why did I believe that? And some of it is because they just omit certain pieces of evidence, which, come on, shame on you, right? You have some uh, agenda. You have some point you're trying to make. 
So you just leave out all the pieces of evidence. So therefore your point makes the most sense. But I started thinking, well, well, why does, you know, looking at the evidence that we've done for the last few months, why did America, why it seems like almost all of America was fooled by this, but I think it's because it's easier. It's easier to think that this was an accident. It's easier to think that a six-year-old was accidentally hit on the head by her brother. The parents did not know what to do. They were scared that they're going to lose their son. And then they did these horrible things. But on some level, on a very small percentage, we all can just justify their actions because they didn't want to lose their son because maybe there was something wrong with their son. We've only seen one interview with him, which is a very odd interview as he has grown up. I think that those are nervous reactions when he talks to Dr. Phil, but I think when you see him as a child, there's some strangeness in those interviews too. But look, it's a nine-year-old kid being interrogated or being questioned after his little sister was murdered. But I think it's easier to come to that conclusion. It's easier to think that than to think somebody took the time to make a device to put around a six-year-old's neck and to pull it so tight that her brain was losing blood and oxygen and was either molesting her or molesting themselves while they choked the life out of this little girl. And they either got so excited that they decided to smash her on the head, splitting her skull pretty much in half. Or like I have theorized that maybe after she was dead, that when they were trying to carry her out on some level, they ended up dropping her. And then they panicked and they left. But I think it's, you see what I'm saying? Where I feel it's almost, it's harder to imagine the latter. It's also very difficult to imagine that the parents did this. It's almost easier than in a sense too that an intruder should be guilty of such a terrible act and such a terrible attack on a child. Yeah. This is a very unpopular opinion, but I lean toward the intruder theory as one that I feel to be more likely. I'm not willing to rule other possibilities out. What? Well, it's just I with th- the, with the damage done, the physical damage done to the victim what I see here is something that is beyond probably the capabilities of the Ramses. And I know that it happens all the time in America and other countries as well, right? Where a parent does something horrible, unspeakable acts to their own child. I understand it. I get it. But at the end of the day, when I can't make what I believe to be an educated decision because the evidence is so messy, then I have to go with my gut. And what my gut tells me is that from the pictures that I've seen of the damage done, I feel like this, this had to be an intruder. And I, I will take that a step further by stating the, the garat itself, the construction of the garat, the construction of those knots, that too appears to me to point toward a certain level of sophistication, meaning somebody that has fashioned one of these devices before. Right. And if the Ramses are simply trying to cover something up, they've had, they've never had a reason to construct one before. Well, all the items that made the garage, made the ransom letter, all everything came from inside the house, Nick. Well, that's not, in fact, entirely true. There were items inside the home that cannot be ruled out as having caused the damage that was made by the blow to the head. Right. But 
we don't have any proof that there was an item inside the home that did in fact make that wound that, well, plus, that made that strike to the head right plus you got a scene that's very contaminated plus on top of that just look at the pictures we're talking about a to me extremely messy house which i would think would make investigating a crime scene way harder so how does this all work out if in fact it was an intruder in my mind this is how it plays out again I'm not willing to say this is 100%. I'm not willing to not say that there are other possibilities. This is, at the end of the day, I put 51% of my eggs in this basket. If this is how the intruder theory goes down, this is how it works and makes sense for me. Yeah. That she was targeted. Somebody broke into the home with the intention of abducting this child for the purpose of sexual assault. They may have broke into the home before or after the family came home. I don't know. It seems to point to me more likely that they may have entered the home while the Ramses were gone. Right. During this time, they brought with them a letter that they copied using stuff that they found in the home, using the felt pen. We know that occurred using Patsy's notepad. We know that occurred. Yeah, and writing why they have gloves on so we don't leave any DNA or fingerprints. The difficulty with the letter itself is we have, Burke didn't write it, according to the analyst, John didn't write it, and then they put Patsy at the low end of the spectrum for possibly writing it. I know, I'm reminding myself that we said earlier it would be irresponsible to eliminate anybody based off of handwriting analysis. The thing here, though, Captain, is what would be the purpose of a ransom letter? I also stated, and I believe you backed me up on this, that the letter itself is a farce. What I meant by that is that there was no, there was never any belief by the the author of that letter or desire to actually cl- collect any money from the family. Right. The letter itself was simply a giant speed bump to persuade the family not to contact the police and give this sick individual more time with the victim. Nick, that never happens. Why would, why would they add to the added risk of, of putting themselves out there like that just to buy some more time? Well, I can point to one situation where it in fact did happen. Amy Mahalovic was abducted from the shopping plaza and allowed to call her mother at work after being in the presence of the abductor simply for the reason of delaying the mother being aware that there was something wrong. And guess what? If the Ramseys would have followed the instructions on that ransom letter, they wouldn't have contacted the police, but they did. One thing that I find weird about the note, and we never discussed this uh, the other day here, Captain, but one thing that I found extremely strange with inside the note itself was how the author speaks in absolutes all the way up to one point and then leaves the window open for a little bit of possibility, a little bit of opportunity to foil the abductor's plan, where the author says, If you do this, she dies. If you do this, she dies. If you don't cooperate with us, you run the risk of her being beheaded, and then we will deny you her body. All these absolutes, she dies, beheaded, denied the body. Right. But then later it states, if you try to outsmart us, you stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter. Right. If you follow our instructions you stand a 100% chance of getting your daughter back. Again, an absolute, but then that 99%, i, I that's what's been keeping me up at night. Why would the author leave that one percentage chance that the Ramses could foil the plan? And, and I think that's because the author really wanted them to believe that the author was in control and that if they followed their instructions... Not only would they get their daughter back, but 
At the very least, if they didn't contact the police, there was still a 1% chance that the Ramseys could outsmart the attacker. I think what occurred really, man, was that the, the note was constructed to buy more time. Who knows how long this individual intended to keep right, her. But you, right, but you believe the note was. It was authentic in a sense that the author wanted the Ramseys to believe it. But it happened before he actually. Yes, because if he killed John Bonet, he would have never wrote the note to begin with. Right. The note gets a ransom note gets the FBI involved, which I think is another thing, which not everybody knows that. But it's like if the family was trying to cover up a murder and you then put a ransom note into play. Now you have the FBI involved. And I wish the FBI was involved from the beginning because if they would have been, I think this case would be solved by now. Yeah. If they wouldn't have located her body in the basement that quickly, if that would have gone 24 hours, the FBI would have taken over this case and this investigation, regardless of finding her body later. The interesting thing here, though, Captain, I think where this whole thing gets messy, it's a complicated case because there are all these things that you have to explain and you have to explain them. And they're not easily explained away because there are things that point to the letter being constructed, not only in the home, but by maybe somebody that lived there. Nothing is easily explained away because the crime didn't go and it wasn't carried out in the manner that it was intended to. Had he been able to remove her from the home right. alive, I want to. That's how my theory goes. This would have looked and taken on a whole different appearance. It would have taken on a whole different investigation. Something happened where he realized or determined in the moment that he couldn't get her out of the house. I don't know what that is. But whatever it is, I'm backing up that the motivating factor for this abduction, which I believe is what was the intention here, was sexual assault, was because this individual had already taken the risk to get what they wanted, and when they could not get her out of the house, they assaulted her inside the home, struck her over the head to make sure that she was dead, and then left. Or possibly got spooked. And I, but I believe that this person knew the house well. They knew that by if you can get her down to the basement, you're now putting two floors between you and her and her parents. Now, do you think this case is solvable? I was actually listening to somebody on the way here to the garage that was, you know, an expert. In my opinion, a very good expert that was saying they believe the case is still has the potential to be solved based off of forensic evidence. Personally, I don't feel very good about this case ever being solved. And the the problem with that is that's without, that's with the exception of having a, somebody come forward saying I did this, this is how I did it. And then they can pull some evidence together and go, yep, we can back up this individual story because of this, this, and this. Right. Where I think this case lends itself to be unsolvable, let's say, is in a court of law. If you make an arrest and somebody isn't willing to confess to the murder, I think it's going to be very difficult to convict based off of public opinion. You could move this case. You know, some cases they do a change of venue because the either the perpetrator doesn't stand a chance or there's problems with the case, whatever. Right. You can move this case to Mars, and it's it's still a mess. It's still a convoluted mess. There are people out there that feel so strongly about their opinion, and that's why that's why part of me only is willing to go fifty one percent in on this intruder theory on my thoughts on the case, because I understand why so many people are are firm in their beliefs and in their opinions of this case. Because just like you pointed out earlier, you watch CBS and you go, yep, I think they nailed it. Now I know what to believe. Right. You watch the A&E thing, same thing, but it's a, it's a different answer. It's a different response. You read Steve Thomas's book. You absolutely believe Patsy did it. You know, it's really 
comes from whoever you get your information from. And I actually don't believe that anybody is out there trying to skew this in any way that's malicious or that's trying to deceive the audience. Right. I think that there, there is evidence that you could argue either way. And if you choose to argue it all one way, it makes a good case for whatever your opinion or your theory is on the case. Well, and Henry Lee said that he didn't, he say that he believes that this is not just a DNA solvable case. Well, I believe what his statement was that he believes that the DNA is of no value to eliminate somebody as a suspect or to convict them in a court of law. Well, so one, I think they need to try to come to some kind of understanding and some conclusion with the DNA to figure out, is it a single male? Is there a mixture? I know that they were talking about doing tests back in uh, 2016 and 2017. I, I have not, I could not find any new results of those because if we do know, because what they could do is they could test that mixture with female DNA and if they have any trace of female DNA that pops in, then they would more likely it's a mixture. And now we got to go back to the drawing boards, but I think they need to figure that out for one. But all, all accounts state that it's male DNA. It was taken from a, um, right. But it's not clear if it's two or three or just one. Yeah. That I don't know. I do know that it was taken from a, um, a, a dual blood sample, if you want to call it that. I don't know if that's the best way to describe it. Right. But what that tells me is that they're taking this fluid and they're finding DNA in the fluid. And if they're saying that it's coming from a dual sample, then they've already been able to identify what that other, where that other sample is coming from. Right. Meaning it came, the most obvious answer is the other DNA comes from John Bonet. Right. And so if they're able to make that conclusion, then I don't think they can rule out 100% that it's not, uh, you know, more than one DNA, but it sounds to me what they are able to conclude is what they're looking at. They believe 100% to be male, unknown male or unidentified male DNA. I think what Lee, what Henry, Henry Lee and several other experts are trying to point out regarding this DNA itself is that the type of DNA it is, is not, it's not indicative of anything that, that may have occurred during the commission of any of these crimes, regardless of, uh, of what crimes you believe took place. This DNA does not have to be there because of a sexual assault. This DNA does not have to be there because of a murder. What they're saying is the problem with the DNA ultimately right now is that they don't know where it came from and they don't know how long it was there. Right. Meaning there's a chance it worked its way there after the fact, after she was already killed, after the perpetrator fled or after John and Patsy started covering up the crime. Right. That there's a chance that that DNA has nothing to do with the murder of this child. And that is the problem. And until they can figure out, you might be able to clear that up. If you can figure out where it came from, if there, it would be a way for you to prove that it's impossible for it to end up on the body after the fact that right. it could have only ended up on her during the commission of these crimes. Right. But if I'm talking with John Ramsey and, and John says to me, I want to hire you for this case. I'd say, John, the first thing we need to do is look at this DNA and we need to come to some consensus uh, with multiple experts. I'd also want to pull in some investigators that, that believe that it was the family. I'd want to pull them in and to have them help with the investigation because they would be our checks and balances. I also think they need to figure out the stun gun theory. I don't know if they can still do it, but I know at the time they were, would have been able to, uh, dig her up and do some tests to figure out if these were train tracks marks or possibly a stun gun or neither or right. And I think that's important. I also think 
this digital molestation, that's what I'm going to call it, that possibly happened on the 22nd or 23rd or the, and then, then happened the, the day of the murder. Now I say the day of the murder because that I believe was in the report and I'm going to throw out this theory and I think there's some investigation that should be done. This is not, this is finger molestation. They believe a finger was inside her. Now you can, you can explain it away in multiple different, you know, with the wiping, uh, aggressive wiping and, and different things. But most people believe this is some form of molestation. I would also argue you have children playing on the 23rd, not always supervised. And then the same thing happens on the 25th. Was there, is there a kid involved and here I'll just put it out there. If is it possible a kid did this and did, wasn't meaning harm by it? It was just a kid not knowing any better. Is that making any sense at all? It certainly makes some sense to me, but I think that the evidence is showing that to me it shows that the digital manipulation, right, is what they they term it, occurred and it probably occurred near at or near the time of her death. Which I would lean that way. I'm just saying, is is this a, a, something that we can, again, it's just like with the train track marks or the stun gun marks. I think it starts narrowing things down. So if we can come to a consensus of that this, there was some kind of, and I'm going to call it digital molestation because it's molestation. Is this happening at the time of her death? Rolling that out. I also think because there's too many coincidences when you look at Santa Bill, there's too many odd things. His daughter was kidnapped 22 years before on the date. It's an unsolved kidnapping. Technically, yes, they find John Benet Ramsey in her house, but there's a ransom note. So to me, it's technically a kidnapping. It's an unsolved kidnapping. And this guy, like I said, I, I looked as much as I could into this bear that was found. And you can look at the crime scene photos and see this bear on the bed. I want to know if it really came from that pageant, if they can prove that. But here's what we do know. Santa Bill was hired by multiple people and worked multiple locations. We have tons of evidence out there. And here's something that the public could actually look for. If your child had any picture with Santa Bill, is there a bear that matches this description? I think if it does, that's enough of a reason for us to go, hey, this this guy needs to be looked into further. The other thing I would want to know is in your Santa Claus outfit, most Santa Clauses wear, wear black boots. I would like to see anybody that has a picture with Santa Bill, what boots are he? What boots is um, is he wearing at the time, and is it possible that they are high tech, which would be the marks that were found, the shoe shoe prints that were found in the basement? So I think those are things that people can look into now and, and get us closer to some answers. It was determined that there were more than one hundred burglaries in the Ramsey's neighborhood in the months before. John Benet's murder. There were 38 registered sex offenders living within a two mile radius of the Ramsey's home. If you can't get enough of the True Crime Garage, make sure you check us out on Stitcher. You can find all of our old episodes and you can find our other show off the record. Hey, Crispy Colonel. What's that? Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us in the garage all year long. We hope to see you back here next year. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to all of the True Crime Garage Army. Until next year, be good, be kind, and don't live.
Canva presents true crime of design. In the office, Maya spots something unusual in the presentation. What's this? It was an off-brand font. Her co-worker explains. I added the font. I thought it was fun. It was not. Maya solved it with Canva. Open up Canva, one click, and the font is on brand. Easy. Stay on brand and solve font crimes at canva.com. The home for every brand.